We're in a series called Shift, and I'm being real careful for the next couple Sundays how I finish this series out saying that word. Uh, but it's, it's talking about this, that if your idea of Christianity is where like, you're having this great old life, and the, the one thing missing is a little cherry on top is Jesus. And you know, hey, come on, Jesus, let's go. And that is the American view of Christianity a lot of times. Like, hey, everything's great for me, and I need a little Jesus just to top it all off. That is not the, what the Bible talks about Christianity is all about. Jesus actually goes the other way, where Jesus is going somewhere, and he commands and invites. He says, hey, come follow me. Stop what you're doing and follow me, and I'll make you into something totally different. And people are like, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Well, that's Christianity. And so it's a radical shift in our mindset of rather than Jesus kind of jumping in the car where we're going, we're over here hitchhiking and he stops graciously to pick us up and take us where he is going. I mean, if you're, if you're like a, a junior in high school, God bless you, that's a tough year, but here's how it goes for juniors in high school. Your entire next two years, people are going, what are you going to do with your life? You can get so tired of answering that question. What if we were asking ourselves, God, what do you want to do with my life? What if you did that as a 60-year-old? You said, here's my question. God, what do you want to do with my life? That is closer to Christianity than the other thing. So it calls for a shift. And, and we're looking at these four words. These are four words for the church. We talked about abide. Last week we talked about grow. And this week we'll be on reach. When I talked about the, the grow thing. I, I talked to you guys about this this, this. this idea of a tethered run. And we're going to show a video in just a moment. But, uh, and the tethered run is between a, a seeing runner. And the seeing runner. Because he can see. He has to offer the tether to the blind runner. Who cannot see. And then the seeing runner has to adjust his steps, his stride, everything about the way that he runs and run in such a way that the blind runner can run with him. In fact, when you win, you win because you run as one person. And you're going to see it in just a minute. It was so good. I said, we've got to show this video. You're going to see these two men run at an Olympic speed level. And it looks like it is one person running. It's an amazing thing. So that was was what it was like to talk about growing. And since I'm going to pick up on this metaphor again, I want to show the video. So Van, if we can show that video, that would be awesome. David Brown, the reigning world champion, goes in lane three alongside Jerome Avery former international sprinter for the United States. I ran with him our first practice. Coach immediately said, you're going to run with him after me. And, you know, the rest has been history. Ah! There you go. Drive, 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 drive. Stay here tight. Running with Jerome, I don't have to worry about going out too far. All I have to focus on is just listening to him. Get up. Nice. Arm action should be exact. We should be hitting the ground at the same time. This time, they're away, and Brown gets away very, very well indeed. Can you see his run? We're like one person. It should look like one person running. That's the, that tracking side on camera is magic to watch because it just shows that uh, they're running almost like one person. Yeah, right. Woo. So, hey, if you uh, get emotion about like that like I do, you're going to get to see them here at the Paralympics coming up. But... Um, so the grow aspect is this, is asking you as, to picture yourself as the blind runner. Who's a little bit ahead of you? Who sees it a little bit better than you do? Who are you holding on to? And you're going to run in such a way that you could never run by yourself. What are their names? Like if you don't say, this is the name of the person who is mentoring me, who is discipling me who explains the Bible to me, who leads me in my community group. It, it, literally, if you don't have a name that you can say, this is who that person is, then I challenge you to grow. Because I think as a Christian, it means we have somebody like that. But this week, I want to talk about reaching because as you see, this tether's got two ends to it. One end that you, you, you have somebody who's a little bit ahead of you. But today, let's talk about the other end. That's where you're the seeing runner and you turn around and see who's, who wants to go and you say, hey, take hold of this and let's go together. Now, I don't know if you could see in that video or not. I talked about it last week. But for the blind runner to actually win the race, the blind person has to cross the finish line first. So in that race, if you were watching, you can watch it again when you go home. The seeing runner at the very last stride has to slow up so that his partner crosses the line in front of him. Oh, there's just so much humility 
and Christianity involved in this that I, I just can't get enough of it. So I want to talk about growing, but I also want to talk about reaching this week. How do we reach out to a world around us? Literally, those of us who can see just another step of the way, how do we look around and say, who needs what God is doing in my life and who do I offer this to? That's what reaching is all about. So I'm in Luke chapter 10. So if, uh, if you have a Bible or you want to use one of the pew Bibles there, Luke chapter 10. And we also want to just, we can't be grateful enough to the Waco Fire Department. And some of them are with us today. I know that Chris Pachachik is over here. So thank you so much. Um, I had the greatest night's sleep on Tuesday night because I don't sleep anywhere near my phone and I got up like at six in the morning to do my thing and, and I, there's beeping coming from all over my, my, my iPad, my computer, my phone. I'm like, what is going on in here? You know, and I start, I mean, I've got like a hundred texts of, of all of some of you guys and all of the Waco people going, where are you? Get up here. The, the church is on fire. I was like, that's a funny joke. And then when you got a hundred of them, it's not a joke anymore, right? So, um, Anyway, so we, we appreciate you guys. I think there were something like 11 different fire departments within Waco on this campus. And what they said was, we're not losing another building in Waco. And I just love their commitment. So uh, in Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus is going to talk to his followers about reaching people. And I really think that you're going to know this passage just a little bit. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. It's that passage. But I really think there's a misinterpretation for most of us when it comes to this passage. So let's just walk through it. It says, verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So as we think about reaching people, remember this, Jesus is not sending you anywhere that he is not already going to go. He's not going to send you out there and go, well, I changed my mind. I'm not going there. You know, good luck with that. It's not that at all. And we, we think about that some, right? Because we, we're seeing what's happening in Afghanistan right now. And we're all crushed about what's going on, not just in Afghanistan, the country, but to Christians in Afghanistan. Up until six weeks ago, Afghanistan was the country with the, the fastest growth of Christianity on the planet. And now we say, what's going to happen to all of these missionaries? What's going to happen to all the Afghanis who have given their lives to Christ? This is a crisis, but it's not a crisis that Jesus Christ is unaware of. He's not asking any of us to go someplace that he is not intending to go. So he sends them on ahead, uh, verse 2. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's between those two sentences that I think we miss the point of this thing. Jesus is sending out people and he's saying there's no problem with the harvest. The people who need God, you realize when you watch the news or wherever you live and wherever you go, there's never a shortage of people who need the Lord. Jesus would say the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, here's where we get it wrong. When there's a period at the end of that sentence, the workers are few. So what we think Jesus prays for is for there to be more workers. But that is not what he's praying for. Not what he's telling you and me to pray for. The harvest is plentiful. The workers, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, not for more laborers, but to send out laborers into the harvest. It's very different. It's almost as if there's not a shortage of laborers, there is a shortage of laborers who are actually out there where the harvest is. In other words, sometimes we have got a lot of people in the pews and not nearly as many people out in Waco taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to Waco. When we started this church, which was two years ago, this week was our first public, here we go, open door policy kind of thing. And it has been a crazy two years. People ask me this question and ask our leadership this question all the time. Why in a, church, in a city full of churches would you start another church? And I got to the point and I said, you're asking the wrong question. Here's the question you should ask me. Why are we not starting a thousand more churches in Waco? Waco, 60% of Waco today is sitting at home or out on the lake or doing whatever. 60% of Waco. Not why did we start another church? Why didn't we start a thousand more churches? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Not that there would be more laborers, but that the laborers would get out there to where the harvest is. And that's you and me. 
We are the ones that God is going to send. It's a very different way of looking at it. Uh, it's not that the laborers are so small, so powerful. No, no, no. They've, the laborers, I mean, the, 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 the Bible says that you have every gift that you need from God to live a life that is pleasing to him right now. He's given it to you. You go, well, I don't feel like I do. Well, d- d- do some growing. Begin to understand all that God has given you. By the way, he put himself in you. The Holy Spirit of God, if you're in Christ, is in, in residence in your life. And now he's saying, get out there and get to work. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. It's not how we look at it a lot of times. There's a, a great book that was written up probably the last 10 years ago called Not a Fan, talking about the difference between our mentality as, as North Americans where we want to be a fan of everything and where Jesus didn't call for fans, he called for followers. And how huge of a difference that is. We want to get the bumper sticker. We want to say, go Jesus. You go get him. Go preacher. Go Sunday school teacher. Go Billy Graham. You guys go get him. And and Jesus is like, hey, it's you that needs to get into the harvest field. I don't know if I'm stepping on anybody's toes or not, but this is hurting me. Somebody said that Christianity is kind of like, if you can imagine a a, a huge football stadium, let's just imagine a McLean Stadium because football is coming back, because college is coming back. We're so excited. You know, a huge football stadium full of 40,000 people, and you got 22 people on the field playing the game. So somebody made this observation. Church is often like a football game. You got 22 people playing a game on the field. You got 40,000 people in the stands watching who look like they should exercise, and 22 guys on the field who are needing a break. And that's what the church is a lot of times. We got a few people doing it. You know, I mean, people say, hey, pastor, we got this need. Hey, da, da, da. I go, why are you calling me? You know the need. Go do it. Go do the thing. I don't know what the thing is. And, and, and the, oh, I'm not a pastor. Well, I, I used to not be either. You know? So I'm going to show you, and don't put it up yet, quite yet, man. Um, I'm going to put up a, an image. It's a shocking image. I'm saying this because I realize we have people of different ages in here. So I, I mean this. I'm, I'm not pulling a fast one on you. If you've got a young person with you, um, I'm going to show a shocking image, and then I'm going to explain the image. And I'm not doing this to offend anybody. I just This is real life, okay? So I'm just giving you a chance to cover somebody's eyes if you need to, and then you can decide if that's something that they can see or not. But I want to show you an image, and I, w- I want to talk about this in a different way. So let's go ahead and put that image up. The Sudan was experiencing incredible famine in 1993. A lot of you are somewhat familiar with this picture. It became a very, very famous picture. Kevin Carter was a photographer, and he was following. When they took this picture, they thought this was a girl. They're not sure. I want to tell you this. The girl makes it in the end. I want to tell you that right now. It's too heavy. The girl makes it in the end. But this girl, he began tracking her. The, the, the Kevin Carter began tracking her as a photographer. She's trying to walk all by herself to a feeding place. It took days. As you can see, she's at the very end of her life. And the vulture saw that too. And so Kevin Carter begins to track the vulture, tracking the girl, waiting for the girl to either become so weak that she couldn't defend herself or just to die outright. And at just the right moment, he snaps the picture. It's popularly known as the vulture and the little girl. He wins a Pulitzer Prize for the picture. As a photographer, you can't go any higher than that. He, he wins the Pulitzer Prize for snapping the picture of a vulture waiting to devour a baby girl. Kevin Carter takes his own life four months after snapping this picture. And here's why. As an artist... He felt like he could not get involved in the picture. He, he could not do anything. It would ruin the moment. And once he took the picture and, and understood the great story, he couldn't live with himself that he did nothing. I've got a... Yeah, his picture's up there too. It, God bless him. He, he, he had to see that, and, but he couldn't live with the regret of knowing that he was there But he's only there to take a picture and not there to make a difference. I want to say this as directly as I know how to say it to everybody in this room. God has not put you here to just watch and not make a difference. 
And many of us have believed that somehow. Somehow we believe that the whole thing was just a little bit of God and the rest of me. And it's the other way. It's just a little bit of me and the rest of God. John the Baptist said it this way. He must increase. I must decrease. And if that's not your, your motto, if that's not your way of living. It, it, and I want to say this, and I'm, and I'm proud to be an American, but this is very anti-American. To say, let God be more in my life and let me be less in my life. If there's something to be done, maybe God wants to use you. Maybe he wants to use me. I don't know. But unless we shift our understanding of what it means to reach people, unless we quit bellyache and say, oh, there's just not enough people in the church. Maybe there are enough people in the church. There's just not enough church people out there. Maybe it's that way. Because Jesus said the fields are ripe. Don't pray for a bigger church. Pray for more laborers to get out into the harvest. So the question for us today is so simple. Is are you out? Are you a follower? Are you just a fan? It's nothing to wear the t-shirt. You get no points for the t-shirt. You get no points for the bumper sticker. You might get some points for showing this morning. I don't know. I don't even know if there are points. But I know this. God wants you to be on mission. There's really such a thing as this, as, as this mission drift kind of thing. You, know, you get the leadership things and they talk about, you know, there's, there's, you can get distracted. It's the easiest thing in the world to get distracted. You know, we got a bunch of people returning to Baylor or maybe going to college for the first time today. And it's going to be the easiest thing in the world for immediately to get off track. If, you're, if you belong to Jesus, you, you get up there and you're going to belong to a hundred other things. It's dangerous business. Here's what Jesus says. Look at verse 3. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. You know what that says to me? It's dangerous work. You want to get into the harvest field? It's dangerous work. Well, I thought I was just teaching Sunday school on a flannel graph. Well, you might be doing more than that, and it might be dangerous. Verse 4, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. He goes into all this other stuff. You go into the house, eat what's set before you. If there's people of peace there, give them peace and they'll give you peace back. And, 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 and eat the food they put before you. And, and, and do not go from house to house. And, and whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what's before you. Heal the sick and, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So easy to get distracted. It's like Jesus says, don't even pack a bag. You don't need an extra set of clothes. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. He says it twice because he knew people like me would be reading this. Like, don't worry about what you're going to eat, Wayne. They're like, oh, I, 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 okay. This is easy. You know, lightning strikes the church. You know what everyone wants to talk about? I had the, the reporters, that, you know what they're talking They want to talk about lightning striking the church. And like, if you got the email, say, man, it's just stuff. Yeah, it's stuff. It's an air conditioner. And it's a sound system. And it's a lot of other things too. But it's just stuff. It's just stuff. And who cares if all of this stuff doesn't get us out into the harvest? It means nothing. But if we use the stuff to stay on mission, then it's important stuff, right? What is the mission? Can you imagine, wake up, he's going to send, Jesus is going to send 72 of his followers, 72 in pairs of two, 36 pairs of two He's sending out. I mean, these are like all-star teams, I guess. Can you imagine just in this room, if God sends us out into Waco, what Waco is going to be like in a month or a year or 10 years? I can't even imagine. Unless we don't think that we're part of the laborers. Unless we pay somebody to do that. You know, we pay missionaries to do that. We pay pastors to do that. Man, there, there's needs all over the place, outside and inside the church. We, have, we live on this, this, this part of our DNA at, at Renew, even though we're young, is this idea of worship one, serve one. This is what it means, in case you lost it. That you're to come here on Sundays and you're to worship for an hour, just free and praise God and worship. And then you're going to turn around on Sundays and find a place to serve. Whoa. <laughs> what? Was, was that in the fine print? No, man, we're putting that on the big print. We don't need more fans. We need people who will go into the harvest. That's what the world needs. The harvest is ripe. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. The laborers are not out in the harvest. So part of our purpose is to try to stay on mission. So we have these words, you know, reach. I hope that when you leave, you think reach. I'm supposed to go reach people. Yes, exactly. If you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ and like you just kind of wandered in here, somebody drug you in here. Man, just... You want to live? You want to live an exciting life? Give your life to Christ. Oh, wow. 
I mean, the universe opens up before you. It's better than the lottery. Although I'd like to see what the lottery felt like one day. That'd be, that'd be good. Here's our mission in case you, you missed it. He tells you what the mission is in verse 9. Heal the sick. You go, well, I can't heal anybody. Neither can I. Be around the sick. Pray for the sick. But be the, the vessel that God uses to heal the sick. It says pray for people. Pray for them. Heal the sick. Tell them. Preach to them. The kingdom of God is here. It's, it's around us. Preach the good news. Share the good news. Illustrate the good news. Be God's kingdom out there. They don't know what love is. You think our world knows what love is? Don't you dare Google the word love. You'll see some terrible things. You think our world knows what grace is? They don't know what grace is. They're more eye for an eye. They're more Old Testament than we are. The harvest needs to see what grace and forgiveness looks like. And as we go out there, we leave the results up to God. I, had, I got this uh, email from somebody. Uh, I don't know this person. I've never met this. I still have never met this person. I want to meet this person, but I haven't yet. So I've chopped out anything that could tell any of you who this person is in case you know. I got this email a couple weeks back. It says, I've attended around six services and miraculously, I look forward to the 11 a.m. service on Sunday morning all week long. Well, I, thank God for small miracles, right? There's sort of like this positive momentum building in my family. And it's so satisfying to see my children thriving at school and now at church. My parents did not raise us going to church at all. So I've never been a member of a congregation. This is a learning experience. Even with just dipping my toe in the water, I've noticed a change in myself and the way I process and perceive life. See, the harvest is all around you. It's not way over yonder. It may be way over yonder, but it may be sitting next to you right now. I don't know. The question is, are you part of the laborers or not? Or do you have the eyes for or not? So I, I, I kind of want to finish this message by just talking about, well, how do you get into the game? I mean, how do you get into it? You go, you know, okay, the abiding thing, coming here and worship, yeah, okay, growing, and, and yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to find someone that's a little bit ahead of me and say, hey, can I hang on and just run with you for a little bit and learn? Yeah. But the reach part, that's the other part. That's the part that says, hey, I'm no longer, you know, just brand new to this thing, and surely there's somebody, you know, if you're kind of a new Christian, you got a family, it may just be your family, I don't know. But you say, hey, let's go together. I, I'll slow down, and maybe I can't run so fast, but I'll slow down enough to where you can go with me. How do you get into the harvest. Four things. Let me just give you these four things if you want to write anything down. Number one, let Jesus become your first love. Let Jesus become your first love. You know, I don't want you to go out of here and hear the words, work hard or work hard, work hard. It's not that at all. If Jesus is not your first love, you can't share him. We share the things that we're excited about. If I go play golf and, and do a little bit better than bogey golf, I guarantee you I'm calling people. Going, yeah, well, ask me about my golf game. You know, I have very good golf. I mean, we, you go and get something on sale and you call people and say, hey, I got that on sale. And it was such a good deal and I love it. And, 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 and we share the stuff that we love. If Jesus is not just part of what you share, if what God is doing in your life is just not someone that, something that you share all the time, let Jesus become your first love because you cannot give away something you don't own. You can't give somebody else something about Jesus that you don't have. Let him become your first love. Secondly, begin serving in some small, unseen, unofficial way. You know, meet somebody before you go out today. And for some of you, you know, if you're of the introverted variety, this is a challenge, man. But, but everything's a challenge. Do something small. Take somebody a cup of coffee. Ask if you can help with that. Look at all these people in these orange shirts, our first impressions team, and just thank them. You're saying, hey, you're out there in the parking lot. We thought it was hot in here. You ought to be on the first impressions thing. And just thank them that they got here an hour before you did. And they're out there saying, hey, we're so glad to see you. You know, I mean, just thank them. Begin to develop that muscle of I'm made to be involved. I'm made to reach somehow. Number three, shift your understanding of what it means to reach somebody. Here's mo most of our understanding is some of you are out there and we know who you are kind of, but you might be thinking this, Wayne is trying to get me to do more. I'm not. I'm not. If your mentality is still uh, that, that, that Wayne's talking about a have to, I'm not. I'm talking about shift your mentality to I get to do this. I get to do this. Uh, I've, got, I've got somebody uh, precious to us and, 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 and she told me, she's been emailing me for about 18 months now. She said, I listened to your sermon. Da, da, da. I go, 
You did? Wait a minute, you listened to this? And kind of thing. She, I gave this challenge. I mean, it's been like two years ago. And she's, she's working through these challenges. I'm like, well, I don't even remember the challenge, but you're doing that. It's amazing. And so about every four months, she's kind of catching me up. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And, and you can see, oh, this is a very scary thing. Pray for me to do this. And oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And, and each time, it's been the same thing. It's like, wow, where has this been all my life? And the most recent thing, was that this person's, uh, I, mean, I mean, gone from A to Z. She's, she's involved in a prison ministry now, right? And they said, would you lead? So I get the email, oh, they want me to lead. What do you think about that? I said, you go get them. And I get to do this. I never thought I could do something like this. Well, you were created to do something like that, or maybe even more crazy. Shift your understanding from having to do something to getting to do it. And that, lastly, as the worship team kind of comes back up here, this final thing that says this, trial and error, find your team. You know, you just have to keep going until you find, you, you may say, I'm gonna try, I'll be the coffee guy. You may hate coffee, okay? I'll be the coffee guy. I can't stand it when people want to- double cream with their, I, okay, maybe coffee is not your team, okay? Maybe first impressions and sweating it out there in August is not your thing. Maybe, maybe you cannot rock babies in our nursery. Maybe not, okay? That doesn't mean give up. See, when you went to a restaurant in Waco and it wasn't the greatest food, you didn't quit eating. I know you didn't. You just found a different restaurant, right? So if something doesn't work the first time, just go and find the next thing. So through trial and error, find who your team is. Find who your team is. I want to end with this, this idea of, of asking you who the names are. In, in your own, own mind, you might answer it. Who are the names as a blind runner that you're holding on and they're leading you? What are their names in your life? If you don't have a name, I'm talking to you. And who are the names on the other end where someone who's just a little bit out of stride, somebody just a little bit behind you, you've turned around and said, slow down enough to say, hey, let's go together. Let's go together. You know, at the end of Kevin Carter's life, he, he couldn't live with regret. Regret's a very powerful thing. I don't want to live with regret. I don't want to wonder what might have happened had I paid attention. I want to shift now. I want to say, God, speak to me. Individually, just speak to me. So, Lord, would you let the words fall on each one of us that need to land and take root in our lives? And, and for the words that were spoken that, that, that don't have anything to do with us, just let those fall to the wayside. But, Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives that we would be laborers in your harvest taking the good news of the kingdom to our people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.